Hello everyone, welcome to our Egyptian online seminar group. First, keep your phones off, then if you have any questions, you can ask our speaker during his presentation. I have great pleasure of welcoming dear Professor Francois Brochet. Francois Brochet is a Dean Research Scholar and Associate Professor of Accounting at Boston University. He was a professor at the Harvard Business School for six years and a visiting professor at MIT for one year. Uh, he received his PhD from New York University. His research has been published in top ranking journals in accounting, such as the Accounting Review, Contemporary Accounting Research, Journal of Financial Economics, Review of Accounting Studies, Journal of Accounting Research, and Management Science. Now we will start our seminar with dear Professor Francois Crochet. Thank you, Mohammed, for both the invitation and the introduction. I am very grateful for this opportunity. And I look forward to uh, any feedback um, you know, participants may have. And as you said, I welcome questions uh, anytime. Feel free to raise your hand or, or speak up. Um, and any questions that I, not, I wouldn't see in the chat, uh, Mohammed, please let me know. Uh, so greetings to you all. Uh, Salam alaikum, I guess. And, uh, and it is my pleasure to be here, uh, here in Boston University. It's graduation day, so uh, it's going to be a busy day. And then this weekend, we're going to have uh, more like Egyptian weather, very hot and uh, humid weekend. Um, actually, well, uh, hot. And, and, uh, but I, I wish I could be in your presence, but um, and I, I hope you have a, a global audience for what should be a, a topic of interest to uh, an international crowd, uh, talking about investor culture and corporate disclosure. Right? So this work is co-authored with Heather Lee at Bentley University. She still resides in Singapore, waiting for her uh, family to have all the visas to move to here to Boston. Uh, and Patricia Naranjo, who was a PhD student at MIT when we got to know each other and now a faculty at Rice University. Um, now, there is an older version of this paper on SSRN uh, called Is Myopia Contagious? But we're in the process of, you know, substantially revising the, the paper. So, um, I, you know, if you want to look it up, feel free. But otherwise, I'll, I'll show you very uh, new tables uh, to a large extent. So be that as it may, let me jump in and motivates why we're looking at this. So uh, there's a growing interest in financial economics in uh, the role that culture may play in affecting a wide range of economic outcomes uh, in terms of investments, but also actually reporting decisions. Um, and there's already evidence to that effect, such as Kim et al. 2017, showing that you know, the linguistic backgrounds of uh, managers leads them to report um, financials in a way that is, um, you know, that varies systematically. Whereas my own paper with Patricia and uh, Greg Miller and Gwen Yu shows that uh, CEOs and other managers with a certain sort of in level of individualism uh, are reporting, you know, during conference calls in a way that again reflects their cultural background. Okay. Now, what do we mean by culture? And for that, we're going to rely on the definition by Guizo et al., which says that culture is a set of beliefs and values widely shared by a group of people. Uh, they're going to shape the behavior of and having a lasting effect on individuals, right? Uh, so when we talk about culture, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, a common behavior across a group of individuals, and you'll see that we'll classify on a country basis, which is not to say that every single individual is going to be different from anyone outside of the group. It's more about the average person in a given cultural group that is expected to behave in a certain way or to have certain preferences, right? And the Guizo et al. definition maps well into economics because you know, beliefs and values can translate into uh, behaviors and preferences. Now, what we know also from the literature, and I'll talk about a little more later, is that the investor base actually also has an impact on how firms decide to make investment and reporting choices. And that has been shown within countries as well as across countries, right? Um, however, we have very little evidence on what are the fundamental drivers of investor preferences, right? There's a, we, we say that some investors are more or less short-term or long-term oriented, but we don't know where that comes from, right? And so our uh, 
you know, assumption is that culture is potentially one such driver. So the research question we address here is whether the cultural backgrounds of institutional investors will shape the disclosure narrative of the firms in which they invest. We're going to primarily examine that using annual reports from companies across 37 countries. Now, all those annual reports are in English, um, but the cross-country variation is going to allow us to see both variation in the cultural backgrounds of the firms themselves, if you will, and the investors. And especially because we are use data sets where we have institution level holdings across firms. So we know that we can see cultural variety in the countries from which the investors come from uh, that invest in those firms, okay? With that being said, whenever you have cross-country data, um, invariably people will legitimately say, well, you know, are you really capturing cu culture or something else? So our secondary setting is going to be limited to US firms where we use uh, 10K filings. In other words, again, annual reports. And there the cultural background of the investors is going to be inferred from the background of the mutual fund managers themselves, right? And I'll talk a little more again about that. All right, culture, that can mean a lot of things in terms of you know, the dimensions that culture can represent, right? So we need to make some choices here. Now, consistent with a broad literature, we rely on the cultural framework of Gert Hofstede, right? A Dutch you know, uh, sociologist who um, you know, ran surveys with IBM employees in the late 60s and uh, early 1970s to uh, infer you know, uh, systematic differences across employees, across countries within the same organization. And uh, his work came up with at first kind of four cultural dimensions, individualism versus collectivism, power distance, masculinity versus femininity, and uncertainty avoidance. Right? Later on, he realized that the, the work was kind of still Western centric and he expanded the work and added two dimensions, long-term versus short-term orientation and indulgence versus restraint. Okay? Now, this doesn't mean that this is a fully comprehensive framework to capture any possible differences between cultures, but at least it is one that is based on the business world um, and that is has been replicated uh, many times um, and therefore used extensively in the literature, including in accounting and finance. So we'll uh, limit ourselves to Hofstede's uh, notion of culture, right? And all of this is at the measured at the country level. The second thing that we rely on is that there's a large literature that shows that institutional investors tend to prefer and firms invest more in capital and expenditures and research and development and innovate more with more patents. Um, and so we believe that those uh, preferences give rise to potential disclosure preferences as well, right? If firms invest more in the future and in riskier investments, such as intangibles and R&D, it stands to reason that they're going to uh, engage in riskier activities and ones that are more in the long term, okay? Accordingly, we expect that disclosure characteristics related to risk and uncertainty and time orientation, which is both horizon, short versus long, but also present versus future, are going to be uh, meaningfully related to investor preferences. And the beauty of this is that you can see that uncertainty avoidance maps conceptually into risk and uncertainty. And likewise, the long-term orientation, cultural dimension maps into the time orientation of disclosures, okay? Therefore, we're, we've already made one choice, which is to go with Ofsted's cultural dimensions. The second choice is obviously, it would be very hard to have a paper looking at yeah. six dimensions. Yeah, please. And so, yeah. One question. Please, Asidi, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, please, uh, time orientation and disclosure characters. Uh, what do you mean about uh, the timing of disclosure? 
Oh, uh, so in in means so the time orientation means how much do firms talk about the short term versus the long term? You know, literally, how often do they say short term or next quarter or next month versus long term? How often do they say we invest in the long term? We're interested in things that happen years from now. And the tense is how often do they use the future tense? You know, we will do this and that versus how often do they use the past or the present, okay? Um, so I'll show you how I measure Thank that. You. Yep. But uh, every time the formation disclosure for the future, not for the past. If you uh, disclosure information for the, the, to take decision in the future. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, I mean, decisions, certainly investor decisions are future oriented. Now, because we uh, use uh, annual reports, primarily they're going to report performance over the past year. And therefore, you know, you know, by construct, they're going to use the past and present tense quite a bit, right, to describe the results and their financial statements. Um, and you know why they invested a certain amount in R and D. Uh, so the, it's, it's an open question as to how much disclosures themselves, um, which are regulated, will actually have uh, more forward-looking statements, right? Uh, even if you know all kind of decision making internally by firms and externally by uh, investors are going to be forward-looking, uh, but the degree to which firms disclose about the future will vary a lot because uh, obviously they're not sure and they expose themselves to uh, shareholder disappointments if they make too many promises about the future. Um, so there's going to be variation in the degree to which firms will talk about uh, the future and the long term. Okay. I hope that addresses your, your comment. Um, so what I wish to say here is that obviously, again, culture is a big concept and disclosure has many dimensions. We collapse our uh, investigation into those two dimensions of culture and disclosure with respect to uncertainty avoidance, potentially mapping into risk and uncertainty disclosures and long-term orientation mapping into long-term disclosure as well. Okay, and accordingly we ask, do firms that have more uncertainty avoiding institutional investors report more risk-oriented disclosure? And do those that have more long-term oriented investors talk more about the long-term? In brief, what do we find? Now, in terms of association, we find that firms that have a culturally more uh, uncertainty avoiding investor base tend to use more risk-oriented disclosures, like right? they talk more about risk in their annual reports. Those that have a culturally more long-term oriented investor base tend to use more long-term oriented words and uh, future oriented as well. Um, when we use firms inclusion in the MSCI all country uh, world index, we find results that suggest a causal effect. That is when there is a unexpected or I would say exogenous influx in, and changing the investor base cultures, the disclosure changes in the same direction. Okay. Finally, though, we find that when firms deviate from uh, their own culture by having more investors that demand disclosure that is not historically what they have uh, uh, disclosed, that creates um, you know, some frictions that results in a, a slight increase um, in information asymmetry and cost of capital. Hello, Professor. Yes. Um, I'm sorry that if I missed it. So in the last slide, when you show there are a lot of uh, cultural dimensions, yep. I wonder if the, the other dimensions like individualism and other stuff uh, will affect the two dimensions you take in the paper. It, it, it is possible, yeah, for, for several reasons. Is, uh, first of all, at least you know in our sample, you know, the cultural dimensions are not completely, completely orthogonal to each other, right? There is a, there is a correlation among those. Um, so it suggests that they, there are some commonalities still, uh, which are such that, for example, individualism could still 
reflect some preferences in terms of risk or time orientation, right? Um, now, conceptually, those do not strike us as obvious, which is why we focus on the ones that we have chosen. But because of your comments, we will control for the other cultural dimensions, both at the firm level and at the investor base level. And you will see that, well, in, in my slides, I'm not going to show the controls just because it's too much, but quite often they do load, right? And they have this occasionally kind of a statistical sig uh, significance in terms of association with um, you know, risk and uncertainty or time irritation. So you're right. Uh, that they they do seem to matter too. It just wasn't obvious to us as to how we could conceptually justify that. Um, but the other thing is, of course, those other dimensions may also explain other dimensions of, of disclosure, right? Again, we, we just collapse it into something that is uh, tractable in, in terms of having in a single article. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, I, I want... have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering if there is any particular reason why did you use the uh, Hofstede's dimension? I know that Hofstede's dimension are well used in the literature, but there are some critics about uh, the use of Hofstede dimensions and some papers use like Schwartz dimensions for, for capturing the cultural differences. So is there any particular reason why did you choose the uh, Hofstede's cultural dimensions? Um, I mean, it's... Yeah, it is acceptance, it is data availability, quite honestly also, right? Because we yeah. can just get the, the measures easily from uh, the, the website. Um, and the fact that so far the literature has, in accounting has used those dimensions, so it's easier to build on that literature. Um, I hear you about the, the criticism. It's, it's obviously, uh, it has limitations, I think, the newer version is improved, you know, because now that they have six dimensions, it certainly is more comprehensive than four. Um, but the, at the end of the day, yeah, the choice is is pragmatic, if you will, because um, you know, if we were to introduce another set of dimensions, such as Schwartz, as you suggested, then we'd have to do more in the paper to to talk about it, because people in in accounting research are not going to be as familiar um, with those. Um, so it's it's not a I wouldn't say I wouldn't defend the choice as being you know intellectually superior. It is one of convenience to to some extent. Okay, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to put some names on uh, the facts that I describe as you know being uh, derived from prior literature in this slide. Um, so as I said, there is a an empirical regularity, which is that institutional ownership tends to be associated with, and to some extent causes more long-term investment and innovation. Now the Agion et al. shows that within the US, right? It's a, I think a QJE paper, but the Benia et al. shows that it's a JFE paper that shows that international, right? So whenever firms, you know, have more foreign institutional ownership, they invest more in capital expenditure, research and development, in uh, human capital as well, um, and then that to, to perform better, right? So there's this idea that in general, regardless of where they're from, foreign investors or even institutional investors tend to prefer innovation, right? So in an international context, and we later we will uh, check that in fact, culture does not affect that choice, right? So whether you have American um, investors or Japanese investors, very different in terms of culture, but they both like firms to invest and innovate, right? They want them to create value, right? Um, the second finding from the literature that we re heavily rely upon is that there's a catering story whereby institutional investors have certain preferences and firms report according to those preferences, right? And generally the preferences that institutional investors have are not surprisingly greater transparency, right? So Boone and White in the US show that firms that receive more institutions, um, you know, by again being added to an index, will you uh, disclose more 8Ks, issue more management forecasts. Internationally, Tseng et al, which is an accounting review paper, showed that firms added to the MSCI 
uh, start issuing more management forecasts, right? So again, there's this idea that institutions want more long-term investment and they want more disclosure, right? Nothing so surprising about it. Um, now there's a paper recently published in CAR that is much more closely related to ours, where they find that investors that are from countries, uh, from a language, I'm sorry, that has a so-called kind of weak future time reference a language, those firms prefer uh, firms that issue more uh, management forecast. And among management forecasts, they focus on long-term ones. Uh, so that is a, a similar idea to R in the sense that they're arguing that the backgrounds of investor, linguistic instead of cultural, but you could argue that those are uh, similar in some way, shapes their preferences and firms abide by that. Um, there's two reasons why, you know, the, we started our paper before being aware of this one, but there's two reasons why we kind of believe that we innovate above and beyond this paper. Um, first, because, um, you know, culture and language still are different, and I'll show you some results that suggest that our results are not driven by language. Um, but also because the problem with management forecasts is if you look at the data, the vast majority of firms in international settings do not have any management forecast, at least not in the databases that uh, people use, right? Um, whereas we're going to use linguistic properties of annual reports that have meaningful variation anywhere from the smallest to the largest firm, right? Um, and the other thing is that, um, you know, the Guan et al. paper uses uh, cross listings uh, in Germany as, um, which is still an endogenous choice, right? Firms choose to cross list in certain countries whereas the MSCI edition is, is not a firm choice. It's purely driven by size. Um, so we'll argue that we have a uh, little more causal evidence. Okay, so just what I said here in terms of literature is gonna map into how we formulate our hypothesis, right? So I just said investors prefer, institutional investors prefer long-term uh, investment and innovation. What this means to us is that this should create demand for long-term and risk-oriented disclosures because cash flow realizations are gonna be later in the future and therefore becomes more uncertain, right? Um, so that's why we choose uh, risk and time orientation in terms of disclosure attributes. From the second set of literature, we know that investor preferences shape disclosures. And from the Guadalajara paper, we know that deeply rooted characteristics such as language, and we argue culture, can shape investor preferences. So from those three points, we just predict that increases in ownership from a certain culture, for example, an investor base that becomes more uncertainty avoiding, will lead firms to disclose more risk-oriented disclosure. And likewise, an, an increase in the long-term orientation, culturally speaking, of the investor base will lead to more long-term oriented disclosure. So let me just show you how uh, Ofsted defines long-term orientation and uncertainty avoidance, and which I'll refer to as LTO and UAI respectively. So long-term orientation stands for the fostering of virtuous oriented towards future rewards, in particular perseverance and thrift, right? Um, it stands in contrast to short-term orientations where uh, virtues are more related to the past and present and or, a certain respect for tradition, preservation of faith, and fulfilling us social obligations. Now, there's quite a lot in there, not all of which maps obviously in disclosure, uh, but I'll you know, build on this to show you kind of how we measure long-term orientation and disclosure. For uncertainty avoidance, right, it really means what it says, right, the degree to which the members of a society feel uncomfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity, right? So the fundamental issue here is how a society deals with the fact that the future can never be known. Should we try to control the future or just let it happen? Okay. So how does that uh, look like? If we look at uncertainty avoidance and long-term orientation at the country level, you can see that there's, um, you know, there's clearly differences between the two, right? Um, so if you look towards the, the bottom left, you will see a lot of the Anglo-Saxon countries such as the US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, tend to be short-term oriented and uh, you know, they're not shy in terms of uncertainty, right? 
Uh, if you look up high, still on the left, you'll see kind of uh, Southern uh, European countries like Portugal and Greece, Spain, tend to uh, be somewhat short-term oriented, but they don't like uncertainty at all, right? Same thing for Latin America. Um, if you look very much to the right though, you'll see that Asian countries tend to be long-term oriented. Now for Singapore, they seem to be very comfortable with uncertainty, very much in contrast to Japan or South Korea um, that are both long-term oriented and uh, a certainty averse, okay? So there's meaningful variation uh, some correlation between the two dimensions, but enough to kind of see that we can separate separate them. Um, so how do we measure disclosure characteristics? Now, time orientation. I have a previous paper with uh, George Serafim and Maria Lugliotti, where we basically count words that relate to the short term, you know, such as day, week, month, quarter, uh, and just explicit mentions of short term. And then long-term words, such as your, yours, uh, or long-term, right? And we show that essentially uh, firms behave in a way that suggests they're more or less short or long-term oriented when they use more short-term or long-term oriented words. Now we use that uh, with US conference calls. So it, it may not work in a national setting, but at least uh, you know this is what we have and we rely on our own. Um, my own dictionary to, to build this uh, measure of horizon. The other thing that the literature has developed is the extent to which, um, oh, and Ayet, go ahead, you have a question? Yeah, thank you. I had a question. Uh, <clears throat> like uh, the way the long-term and short-term had been um, explained theoretically, it seems that uh, short-term is more related to pre uh, present and uh, past and long-term is more related to future, right? Um, well, not necessarily, right? So it's because the, the way we measure it is we really just count uh, mentions of certain words that are markers of time. But you could say, let's say next week, I will go to the beach. That is a short-term oriented statement, but it is a future oriented one, right? Um, Conversely, you could say in the last three years, we've been investing in you know, uh, our employees. So that is a long-term oriented one, but a past oriented one. Um, now, intuitively you're right because we tend to think, yeah, long-term goes along with future, uh, but it's not necessarily the case. And, and especially in annual reports because we don't know how much future oriented language there is in there. Um, which is why we have both horizon and tenses, right? Forward-looking statements uh, will measure basically how many sentences uh, or words are future-oriented. And what we do then is that we try to measure at the sentence level, whether they use uh, short-term and, uh, and future-oriented words or long-term and future-oriented words. For completeness, we also measure the number of sentences that are in the past or the present, right? So we count verbs. Um, so they may be even sort of uh, more, uh, several verbs per sentence. Yep, that now, makes course, sense. If, yeah. if both past and present uh, is kept, uh, captured in long term, that makes sense then. Yeah. Sure thing, yeah. Uh, now, of course, you know, those are multidimensional you know, measures. So we use factor analysis to collapse it into a single measure of time orientation, right? And what we do is that we take the first factor, which explains about 55% of the total variation in all those measures. So if you look to the, the right of the slide here, uh, the loadings are there. So let me explain a little bit, right? The, our, the first factor loads positively on short words, right? So it tends to be higher the more short-term oriented words they are. Again, day, week, quarter, month. And it is negatively associated with long-term words. Again, long-term or years, okay? And then when we combine the ratio of short-term, long-term, again, it is positively associated, right? So um, that is very reassuring. In that sense, the factor goes in opposite direction uh, in terms of loadings on short and long-term words. So it's really meaningfully capturing variation in horizon. What we call a short BRV FLS here is the number of sentences that are both short-term oriented and forward-looking, right? 
So likewise, there's a positive loading on that and a negative loading on long-term oriented and future oriented sentences. And then to completeness, we also add just you know, the degree of forward-looking statements. That's BRV stands for Bozanic, Rolston, and, um, oops, sorry, uh, Van Bisberg. And we also use the LIWC uh, dictionary to count um, you know, future, but also kind of present and past. And what we find again is also using that as a marker of future orientation that there is more short-term, less long-term on the first kind of factor. Um, the table got cut a little bit, but in the bottom, you also have the loadings on past and present. Um, now, because this tends to be higher for short-term orientation, we multiply it by minus one, so that higher values mean more long-term orientation later on in the regressions. Now, let me explain how we measure the risk and uncertainty, right? So likewise, we, we use a, a, a mix of different measures. By the way, the reason we do that is that because all those measures have been used in the US, but not internationally. So we don't know how well each individual measure would do in an international sample, which is why we kind of throw them all together to increase power. So finally, in 2006, I had a paper on the risk sentiment of annual reports. So we has a pretty short, maybe 20 word list. We count those words in annual reports to measure risk. Then we use the Campbell et al. measure, which uh, has themes, right? There's financial risk, idiosyncratic one, uh, legal and regulatory, systemic and tax related. So we count words from their dictionary related to risk separately. And then we use the Kravit and Muslu paper, uh, which is a sentence count measure rather than the word count. And because we're interested in uncertainty avoidance and risk is only one uh, potential, uh, partially related to uncertainty, we also use the word count from the Lothran and McDonald dictionary of uncertainty, right? And then again, we use the factor analysis. And the first factor explained about 88% of the variation in all those individual measures. As you can see, it loads positively on all the individual risk and uncertainty metrics, except for idiosyncratic risk, interestingly. But all the others um, you know, are positively associated with the first factor. And that's going to be our measure of risk slash uncertainty. Let's see how I'm doing on time here. OK. So our first regression model, uh, again, this is going to be a naive OLS in the sense that we're aware that there, those are just correlation at this point, right? But we estimate the following model. I show you two regressions just so it's not crowded, but it's really just the same model, right? So on the left-hand side, we either have disclosure time or disclosure risk, right? The first factor that I just introduced um, from in the previous two slides. LTO in the first equation is going to be, in the international sample, the culture of the firm as derived from where it is headquartered, right? So if you have a firm that is headquartered in Japan, it's going to be considered as a high, a long-term oriented firm. Uh, so when we don't include country fixed effects, we can see whether more or less long-term oriented firms use more or less long-term oriented disclosure. Likewise, UAI in the second equation next to beta one is going to be the uncertainty avoidance of the firm, if you will, at least of the country in which the firm is. But when we include country fixed effect, that's going to disappear, right? Because it's not time varying. Um, instead, then we use the CEO level um, background. Now, whenever we use an individual's cultural background, we use their last name and we match that with the US census data, uh, which tells us the country of origin of individuals uh, based, um, you know, based on their name. So the advantage of that is it's, it's fairly comprehensive, but of course, you know, any name that is of people that have never immigrated to the US will be missed. If that's the case, we assume that the CEO is of the same culture as the country in which they are, which is a reasonable assumption because, uh, you know, to a large extent, especially outside of the US, CEOs are, are from the, their home country, right? The country of the firm. For the investor base, which is really our coefficient of interest, beta two, uh, 
LTO fund is going to be the weighted average of the culture of the, each fund in the investor base, where we infer the fund's culture from its country of origin, right? So our database says, for example, you know, this Norwegian fund is investing in this, you know, Egyptian company. So we can tell from the data set where the, each investor, institutional investor is from, right? And then we take a weighted average based on the size of their stake in the firm, right? Um, now, when we use the US sample only, we're going to use the CRISP database that has the name of the fund managers. Uh, and so it, what we do instead here, when we have no variation at the country level is that we infer the uh, culture of the investor base based again on the weighted average of all the cultures of the investors or the fund managers specifically, right? Um, so you see, we take advantage of different databases uh, and techniques based on last names to uh, zoom in on the culture of the investor base and the firm or the manager um, using as many fixed effects as we can, right? So let me briefly describe the sample, right? We use uh, primarily for US firms, we just use the Edgar system, right? Consistent with US uh, centric st studies. Um, for non-US firms, we retrieve annual reports in English from the Global Reports Database in Bureau of Dykes, um, and we had access until 2015, so that's why our sample period spans uh, 2000 to 2015. Yeah. Um, there is you know, significant coverage, but we lose quite a few observations because we don't have any information on their investor base in fact set. Uh, we drop a few countries for which we have, um, you know, too few observations. And, um, and then there are countries for which the um, half state measures are not available or some other sort of controls. And, and then sort of some for which we, there's the, the reports themselves, we cannot extract text variables sometimes because they actually are not in English. Um, and so we end up with a little less than 100,000 observations. A lot of which are from the US, but still a majority are non-US. So the first set of results that we find is the following. And I'm going to draw your attention to the first row here uh, in the first two columns, because that's really what we're interested in, right? So when disclosure time is the left-hand side, meaning that the higher means the more long-term oriented, uh, we can see that when the investor base is more long-term oriented, culturally speaking, then firms tend to use more long-term oriented disclosure. That is true in the first column when uh, there's no country fixed effect, right? Um, in which case, uh, the second coefficient below LTO is the culture of the firm, if you will. So that also loads positively. But in uh, column two, when we restrict, when we have country fixed effect, so all the variation comes from differences across managers, the manager's culture doesn't come through, but that of the investor base still does, right? So with uh, T-statistics of 1.94, so therefore it appears as if even, you know, uh, when we control for, uh, when we go within country, firms that tend to have more long-term oriented investor base, culturally speaking, would tend to use more long-term oriented disclosure. Likewise, when we look at the uncertainty avoidance culturally speaking, of the investor base, we see that the more uncertainty averse they are, the more risk firms tend to disclose in their annual report. When we limit the sample to the US, we find similar results, right? So the uh, long-term orientation of the investor base as inferred from the culture uh, of the, or from the last names of the managers, uh, I'm sorry, the, the fund managers, the mutual fund managers, loads positively for long-term orientation and for uh, risk and uncertainty avoidance, right? So depending on where mutual fund managers in the US come from or where their ancestors come from, we can see that the culture of their ancestors appears to shape their preferences for certain disclosure attributes. Now, of course, at this point, it's, it's a bit too premature for me to make such causal statements. So let me uh, move to 
uh, our uh, identification strategy, which is consistent with prior literature of using firms addition to the MSCI all country word index, right? Um, so firms get added to the MSCI based on a size, size threshold, right? And every quarter or so, uh, MSCI will um, potentially add or drop firms depending on whether um, they um, you know, pass a certain threshold. The, the goal of the index is to really capture a certain percentage of the total market capitalization um, in a given country, right? What's important for us is that there's no reason to believe that firms can do anything uh, to strategically be included and certainly not control the cultural orientation of their investor base. A firm is going to you know, be added and then by construct, every investor out there that uses the MSCI for investing decision, usually for because they're replicating indexes, are, is going to invest in that firm automatically, right? Regardless of where they come from. So that for us creates an influx of investors uh, from different cultures. The problem though, is that the direction in which that's going to affect the investor base depends on where the firm is from, right? Because if you have a, a very short-term oriented, a firm in a very short-term oriented country, its investor base cannot get more short-term oriented. It's gonna be more long-term oriented. And conversely, if a firm is located in a country that is more long-term oriented, you know, mechanically, its investor base is gonna become more short-term oriented. That's why we have two coefficients of interest, post MSCI, and then post MSCI times LTO or UAI, right? So culturally more short-term oriented countries, we expect them that they will receive more long-term oriented investors and therefore we use more long-term oriented disclosure. That's beta one. But culturally more long-term oriented countries and firms located in those will receive more short-term oriented investments or investors, I'm sorry, culturally speaking again, and therefore we expect them to be relatively, to use relatively more short-term oriented disclosure. And same thing using uncertainty, avoidance and, and risk. So indeed, this is what we find, I'm sorry. Oops. Um, when we look at disclosure time, we can see that after a firm is added to the MSCI index, when it is, uh, culturally speaking, short-term oriented, so let's say we have a Australian firm, um, then that firm, after being added to the index, starts using more long-term oriented disclosure and more risk-oriented disclosure. Conversely, when a firm, uh, say from Japan, uh, is added to the MSCI, then they take to use more short-term oriented disclosure and relatively less risk uh, related disclosure. Okay. Um, now we look into the, the so-called parallel trends to see whether you know, that phenomenon that we uh, capture is in fact kind of preempted uh, the graphs don't look that good, actually, but uh, the uh, if we sh if I showed you the regression, it's it's just much harder to put on a slide. We see that the coefficients prior to MSCI additions are always insignificant. So if you look at the the vertical bars on the slides, uh, as long as they touch zero, it means that the coefficient is insignificant, right? Um, so what we see is that basically. Um, you know, none of the coefficients are significant before the addition. Now for LTO, they, for the most part, become significant, but it takes uh, a couple of years, right? You can see um, uh, as of year three and four, it becomes uh, significant. Same thing for uh, uncertainty, avoidance, and risk, right? It only becomes significant really in, um, interestingly, just in year zero, but then year three and four. Um, I'm not too concerned about that in a sense that I don't expect firms to immediately change their annual reports to, uh, to cater to investors. So it makes sense that it would take uh, about three years to kick in, right? But more importantly to us, none of the coefficients before year zero are significantly different from zero. Uh, 
Now, there's another way to use the MSCI. Again, we rely, we just follow the, the literature here, is to use an instrument or variable approach with a two stage where we first model the in culture of the investor base as the function of the addition to MSCI. And yet, then in the second stage, we use the instrumented uh, measure of the culture. Um, and in that case, we expect the disclosure time orientation to be positively associated with the instrumented long-term orientation of the investor base, respectively the risk orientation of the disclosure with the uncertainty avoidance of the investor base. In other words, beta one should be positive in the second stage um, with both. And what we find again, yeah, consistent with what I just show you with the defendif is that in the first stage, uh, we see that the, uh, the culture of the investor base changes. And then in the second stage, which is uh, column two and four respectively, the instrumented cultural basis, uh, uh, the instrumented culture of the investor base is positively associated with the time orientation and the risk orientation of the disclosure by the firms that are added to the index. So this is more comforting in terms of uh, making causal claims about investors leading companies to use disclosure that corresponds to their cultural preferences. But, and this is the so what, right? Typically in accounting, you show results in terms of explaining changes in disclosure. People ask you, okay, fine, you show that culture changes disclosure, but who cares, right? What does that do for us? So what we investigate next is whether those preferences in terms of disclosure have capital market consequences. More specifically, what we're interested in is whether, you know, you have a firm, let's say a, a Japanese company that is used to disclosing a certain way, perhaps to, you know, I mean, in Japan, I think guidance is essentially mandatory, but it's going to be on an annual basis. And Japanese firms tend to disclose to the public their three-year plans, right? Um, and then you have a bunch of American investors that come in and say, could you please give us quarterly updates on your performance, right? And the firms are going to do it, right? I've talked to two analysts that have seen firms kind of abide by those demands, right? Uh, conversely, you, you think about Australian companies that are added to the MSCI, and then their Japanese investors are going to say, we want you to Tell, give us more uh, reassurance about your management of risk, right? Talk more about your risk. Um, but the problem is that you're going to have a culturally diverse you know, investor base with people with different preferences. And we ask ourselves, does that create exacerbate information asymmetry? Because now people are confused, right? Um, they're some people are used to processing information that is short-term oriented, again, quarterly updates on performance. Others are more interested and more used to processing long-term oriented information. Uh, some people are not gonna be, be used to having a lot of talk about risk. And they might think like, oh, you know, what is wrong with this firm? Whereas others are gonna be uncomfortable with this not enough risk information. So all of this to say that we test whether you know, the change in disclosure time and risk orientation will create frictions in such a way that would partially mitigate the otherwise well-documented liquidity benefits of having more institutional ownership and more foreign institutional ownership on average. We go one step further, although we may remove this from the paper because it's, it's more controversial and unnecessary in some way, but we try to see whether that effect translates into a higher cost of capital, right? Now, some people believe in the Easley and O'Hara story whereby an increase in information and symmetry leads to an increase in cost of capital. Others will say, no, you know, if you can diversify away the role of information, then that shouldn't uh, be the case. Um, be that as it may, we kind of leave it as a, um, you know, null hypothesis where we say that changes in the time and risk orientation um, of firms disclosure induced by changes in the cultural time orientation and uncertainty avoidance of the investor base do not affect the firm's liquidity or cost of capital. So how do we test that? We basically uh, use uh, estimated residual. Uh, we start by running our first model, but without the cultural 
the culture of the investor base, right? Who we estimate what the disclosure time orientation and risk orientation of the firm should be if the only culture that mattered was that of the, the firm itself. And then we rerun this regression, but with our full model where we include the culture of the investor base as well. And then we take the estimated disclosure attributes from both and we take the absolute difference. We will label it absolute abnormal disclosure time orientation or um, uncertainty avoidance driven, right? So it is the portion of disclosure that is explained by the investor base of the firm. And then we run different proxies for information asymmetry and cost of capital on that measure, as well as the usual controls. And information asymmetry is going to be um, a first factor from a principal component analysis of the usual measures in the literature. Bid ask spread, again, average at the firm year level, the proportion of trading days that have zero returns, and the Yakov Hood's 2002 liquidity uh, price impact measure. For cost of capital, likewise, we use several proxies from the literature. We tend to use the ones that are least consuming in terms of data, because again, in international setting, we lose observations when they don't have analysts following to compute the inputs. But we use those papers, the Klaus and Thomas, the Gebhardt et al., the Olson and uh, Jerton Noroth, and the Easton uh, price earnings growth, uh, cost of capital. And then we just average across those measures. Um, no, that should be, uh, the, the red sign is, is the wrong, it should be to the right. Let's look at the results here. So what we see, oh, sorry, and is in interest, let's say in the first column, information asymmetry appears to be higher when the there is, a greater variation in the disclosure time orientation of the firm as explained by the time orientation of the investor base. Likewise, there's higher information asymmetry when there's greater deviation from the firm's kind of historical risk disclosure as explained by the investor base. And we find similar results in terms of cost of capital. If you want kind of uh, any indication of the economic significance here, it looks as if you know, going from a very short-term oriented you know, um, uh, firm, having very long-term oriented investors, that will increase cost of capital by about 20 basis points, right? So not a huge effect, but uh, as expected, right? you would not expect that to be something uh, very strong, right? Because it's the effect of the investor base on disclosure, right? So we're not saying that having more long-term oriented investors is going to increase information asymmetry. We're only saying that if those investors demand more long-term information, that's going to create confusion for historically uh, short-term oriented investors. And as a result, will partially increase information asymmetry. But it may again rely on the MSCI to make more uh, a cleaner uh, claim here. So when firms are added to the MSCI, consistent with prior literature, we find that their information asymmetry goes down. And so there's their cost of capital. That's the first, first row here, right? So we're not disputing that. What we're saying is the second coefficient. We're saying that condition upon that average benefit, some of it is partially mitigated by cultural misalignment, right? You cannot satisfy all of your investors, at least not in your annual report, because that's a single document. And so the choices that you have to make to cater to your new investor base creates a little bit of confusion, right? And as a result, uh, an increase in information asymmetry. And that's what we find here, as well as here in terms of cost of capital. And also, uh, if you look at the fourth row, same thing for uh, risk disclosures. Okay, I have a bunch of additional tests. Uh, unless you're interested, I'm not gonna show you the tables, but I can easily do that. I just need to click on those links and it'll take us to the tables, but I'm just going to describe them right now. 
Um, the, the first two are not very important, but let me briefly say that, you know, because uh, again, we know from prior literature that when firms get more institutional ownership, foreign or domestic, they tend to invest more in the long term, right? What we find is that the results that we document are stronger the more firms invest in the future and the more volatile their cash flows are, right? Um, but again, interestingly, firms invest more in the long term regardless of the culture of the investor base, right? So what we find is that, yes, you know, more long-term oriented firms in terms of investments are the ones for which our results are, are stronger. Um, but the culture aspect really comes through disclosure, not the fundamentals themselves. We also find that, you know, in some sense, the both active and passive investors appear to drive the results, right? And we're not surprised by that because in some way, uh, whether investors are so-called passive or active, um, they're going to need disclosure to monitor the firm, right? Um, the third one is more important and more meaningful to me because, you know, when you have, you know, arguably we're showing things that are highly unobservable here. We're saying investors are influencing firms annual reports uh, and people are saying, well, how can that happen, right? So we try to document a potential mechanism for, for this by looking at when firms participate in investor conferences. And specifically, when you have firms that tend to be more in investor conferences abroad, right? So this is a place where, again, a Japanese firms might go to a conference in New York and talk to uh, American investors there. And there, the American investors are going to say, you know, we, we like that you invest in the long term, but we still want quarterly guidance, like to make sure that, you know, everything is fine in, on, on track. Um, and so accordingly, we look at firms that do go abroad. And what we see is that um, it works well for the long-term orientation, right? So when you have a more long-term orient, the more long-term oriented your investor base is, the more you're going to use long-term oriented disclosure when you tend to go to investor conferences abroad. Right. It's not showing at all on the second column for firms that do not attend investor conferences abroad. And the coefficients are different. Now, it doesn't work as well for uncertainty avoidance, right? Because the coefficient is significant for both, right? Even though the magnitude is, is almost twice as much for uh, those that go abroad, it's not statistically different from the ones that don't, right? So there's you know, it only works for, for disclosure time and orientation, right? So this is one way in which we argue that this is a potential uh, mechanism via which investors convince firms to cater to their preferences. Um, you know, another thing would be great, it would be conference calls because we can observe the questions that analysts ask. Uh, the problem is that we would not have much power uh, if we did that. Um, because there are far fewer firms for which uh, we would have conference calls relative to annual reports. Okay. Um, the other question you know, that came up is, you know, we're talking, we're measuring misalignments between the firm and the investor base in terms of culture. But what about its heterogeneity, right? It's not so much that the firm deviates from its, uh, you know, domestic culture, but perhaps the fact that you know you have Australian and American and Norwegian and Egyptian investors all going into the same firm and all wanting somewhat different uh, disclosure attributes, right? Um, well, it's possible that it is also driving the results, right? Because when we look at the standard deviation of the culture of the investor base, we also find that that effect on disclosure tends to exacerbate information asymmetry. Um, it doesn't come through with cost of capital though, but that's okay, right? So again, if, if you're wondering, is it to the information frictions that we show in the back end, are they due to misalignment or heterogeneity? I would say it's likely both, right? And I'm fine with that. 
Something else that came up, uh, especially because of the Guam et al. paper that uses language as a way to shape investor preferences. Um, so is it cultural language? I would argue it is likely culture that we document uh, because when we limit our sample to English speaking countries, there's still some variation among those countries in terms of long-term orientation and uncertainty avoidance. We still find uh, variation in the investor base and um, the funds, uh, I'm sorry, the firm itself, but more importantly, the investor base, the long-term orientation thereof is positively associated with the, the disclosure time orientation. And likewise, the uncertainty avoidance uh, is associated with the risk. Now it doesn't survive when we include country fixed effects because there we just don't have enough variation uh, in that sample. Right, so that's that's a limitation in terms of, of statistical power, but still the fact that it comes through here suggests to me that this is not a language effect, but a cultural one because all observations here are English speaking. And then finally, we have a bunch of other robustness tests in the online appendix, you know, about controlling for uh, a, a lot of other things, uh, but I'll, I'll spare you those details. Uh, Yahoo, you have a question. Oh, yes. Hi, um, this is Yao Yu from UMass Amherst. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very interesting paper. Oh, you're very so regarding, <laughs> Yes, yes. That's why I mentioned my UMass Amherst. Uh, so regarding the point, uh, whether it's a culture or language, I also mm -hmm. had the same question. But my question is from a different um, point. It's not uh, which language, English or Japanese you speak, but the it's more like the language or the language style uh, in the country where the company uh, is listed, I mean, the accounting regulations. So one, say a, a Japanese company is listed in the US, the disclosure has to be tailored to the um, FASB standards instead of uh, Japan's local gap. Mm -hmm. So such difference in regulations, I believe they have an impact in the, in the language of their 10K disclosure. So I think it will be helpful if you can show that um, where the effect you find come from. Is it from uh, regulators uh, demanded boi uh, boiler style, um, I mean, the, the templates, the disclosure mm -hmm. templates that are similar to all the firms or mm -hmm. from the company's own unique disclosures, some disclosure about uh, on their own uh, unique mm -hmm. uh, aspects? Yeah, I think yeah. that would be helpful. To Sure, but you clarify. Thank you for asking this because this is important that we do not look at cross listings, right? So when we look uh, at the MFDI, uh, the investors come to the firm. It's not the, the other way around. Therefore, the Japanese firms is, is still uh, only uh, producing its annual report according to uh, the Japanese regulator, right? Okay. Uh, so that's that's what's interesting and, and perhaps surprising because we look at annual reports and you'd think that those should not so much reflect the, the foreign investors preferences, if anything, that should be voluntary disclosure. Um, so yeah, yeah, but it, it still comes through right. Um, so the, the risk factors that, that none of that is the Japanese firms is not trying to abide by um, the US. Um, the SEC's demand in terms of risk disclosure. It's still only uh, based on their domestic regulation. Okay, good to know, thank you. Mm -hmm. My pleasure, yeah. Okay, so I've reached my contribution slide and I uh, will sort of summarize our findings as well as express what I think is the primary and secondary contribution of this paper, right? So first of all, you know, we know from prior literature that culture has an impact on the way firms disclose and invest, and also how in investors behave, right? There's some papers that show, for example, that momentum trading varies with the culture of the, the country. Um, so there's no dispute that um, culture affects managers and investors. The novelty here is that investors' culture affects firm's disclosure, right? So a, a demand side story, if you will. Again, the Guan and all car paper, it in some way makes a, a similar, has a similar conclusion. They show that the language future time reference is associated with management forecast issuance. So we improve upon that paper, uh, again, by looking at disclosure narratives, which vary 
meaningfully in the cross section across all firms, whereas management forecast is equal to zero for more than half of, of their sample. Um, and B, you know, we look at a mandatory disclosure, right? The annual reports, as opposed to a, a voluntary disclosure such as guidance, it's complementary, both are good, uh, but it's a different type of disclosure. Um, and B, this is why it was important to me to distinguish culture from language because, you know, their paper focuses on language. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing is we use MSCI as an identification strategy. And we highlight two cultural dimensions. Uh, long-term orientation does have a lot of coverage. Uh, there's a paper on the long-term orientation of analysts and how they issue more long-term oriented forecasts. It's a working paper by Xu Ping Chen and co-author. So if you're interested in kind of that cultural dimension, uh, check it out. Uh, uncertainty avoidance is, you know, has been looked at in the, the literature a little bit, but so, you know, we believe that by putting forward two cultural dimensions and mapping those into two disclosure attributes, both of which uh, are meaningful, we're kind of expanding the, the, uh, the idea that culture really matters, right, in, in, this, uh, in shaping disclosure. The other thing, though, which is important is that, again, the literature on foreign institutional ownership overwhelmingly says it's beneficial. Better governance, higher firm value, more transparency, more long-term investment, again, we're, uh, and higher liquidity. We're not disputing that. We're saying, wait a second. Yes, you know, there are all those benefits, but when you have a lot of culturally diverse investors that come in, uh, you know, there might have preferences that are irreconcilable in some way. And so that partially undoes, uh, uh, you know, mitigates the liquidity benefits, only partially, right, of course, right? Um, and so we believe that we're showing kind of more comprehensively, you know, the cost and benefits of having, uh, you know, an, a global investor base by documenting a potential cost. And more secondarily, we think that it's interesting, especially for LTO, that culture is a plausibly exogenous source of variation in investor preferences, right? So you're probably familiar with the whole literature uh, started you know, by Brian Boucher about transient investors versus dedicated investors, right? The idea that in, uh, institutions are more or less short-term or long-term oriented, but we've never known where that comes from, right? Right, it's just because it's endogenously constructed. You can see from portfolio turnover, we can infer how short-term or long-term oriented uh, investors are, but we don't know why some of them are short-term invested uh, in oriented and, and long-term oriented. So we argue that we identify one potential small but uh, exogenous source of variation in long-term orientation. And the other thing finally is that we're the first to examine important textual properties of annual reports that have been used extensively in the US, but not outside, right? Namely, horizon, the degree of forward-looking statements and risk and uncertainty disclosure uh, using across the country setting, okay? Um, I thank you for your questions. If there's more, uh, I'm more than happy to, uh, to address them now. But before that, I wanted to formally thank you um, for you know, taking the time and um, I'll stop sharing the, the screen. Uh, thank you very much, dear uh, Professor uh, Francois, for your contribution and uh, your effort. It's really an excellent presentation and excellent paper. Thank you very much. Uh, now, if anyone has any questions, you can open your mic and ask your question. Uh, Angie? And uh, Dr. Inji, do you have any questions? If anyone have any questions, you can uh, open your mic and ask your question. I, I will address the one in the, the chat, right, from Iyad. Yes. Do you think information asymmetry might subject to endogeneity or mediated variables related to managerial behavioral misconduct? Uh, Uh, certainly that, that would have an impact. The question is, does that come through um, the MSCI? So uh, my short answer is potentially yes. In the, the first regression that I showed where we just show information in symmetry on the left-hand side, 
and our uh, variables of interest on the right hand side, it is always possible that correlated variables uh, are present, uh, including the ones that you mentioned, because I'm not sure I, I, we, we control for leverage and kind of other, you know, standard um, controls for, you know, the free cash flow problem and things like that, but I don't think we control for earnings management, so we could do that. Um, once we use the MSCI, I'm a little more confident that our results are less likely driven by those behaviors because if anything, you know, firms tend to be better governed once they're added to the MSCI. So probably it would go in the opposite direction, right? Um, but, you know, that's, that's a very reasonable point. Thank you. Is there another question? If you don't have any questions, you can open your mic and ask your questions. Uh, thank you very much, dear uh, Professor Francois, and thank you very much uh, everyone joining us uh, today. Uh, and uh, thank you very much to take the time out to present it to, to us today, uh, dear Professor Francois. It's really, uh, it's really appreciated. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you soon in Egypt. You are very, very welcome. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much.